So after using the Fitbit Charge 5 for quite some time and comparing it to many other smartwatches and fitness trackers, I'm quite convinced that this Fitbit is probably the most effective tool to actually get healthier. The key reason why I think this is the case is that it's just so simple and easy to use and most importantly, easy to understand, even though it may come at a premium monthly expense. More on that a little bit later. But first, let's go into the highlights of this wonderful fitness tracker and some of the quirks or annoyances I've had with it. So just a warning, this review may seem overly positive, but I just want to quickly mention that I did not receive the Fitbit Charge 5 for free or anything like that. I actually purchased it from Best Buy at retail price with my own money. So with that in mind, let's jump into the review. So the biggest and most notable upgrade is the wonderful bright AMOLED display. Finally, we have an always on display. Now this always on display is a game changer in my opinion. It has made it possible for me to actually wear this watch because in 2021, I refused to wear anything on my wrist that doesn't have a good always on display with at least three days of battery life. Obviously, this is a matter of personal preference, but I'm not a fan of having to use some kind of gesture or double tap just to see the time every day, every second. Another thing I really like about this display is that it really has some nice vibrant colors and it really complements this sleek and sexy fitness tracker in terms of just giving it a nice pop in terms of looks. So this Charge 5 has some really cool watch faces that really take advantage of this OLED technology that is using for the display. For example, in this video that I'm showing you right now, you can see how the number font is only showing the outline and therefore it's only lighting a minimal amount of pixels to give shape to the font, which should preserve more battery. And when you turn on the display, you can see that the number is filled with pixels to give it a more bold look. Now, thankfully, the developers at Fitbit made it really easy to kind of set a schedule for when always on display is not enabled so that you're not distracted at night when you're going to sleep and you kind of have like a semi bright display that's kind of always on. Does it make sense to have it always on? So you can set a range. So this display has a very strong contrast appearance. So I've never had any issues trying to view this watch in pure sunlight or in the daylight even at the dimmest settings. Now, yes, I would have much preferred a trans-reflective display like the ones you see on the Garmin VivoActive 4 or on my TicWatch Pro 3. I think it's a real shame that all these manufacturers are switching to OLED display technology because it really impacts the battery life when always on display is enabled. And for a small fitness tracker like this, I don't think it's necessary to have such a beautiful, vibrant display at the expense of battery life. I guess, in other words, if someone offered me OLED technology or long, multi-week battery life, I would always pick the longer battery life, especially for a watch like this. So speaking about battery life, let's talk about that. Now, with always on display enabled, and maybe you had a couple of GPS tracking sessions for your activities, you're gonna maybe have about three days of battery life, which isn't that bad. That's comparable to the TicWatch Pro 3. And if you turn off always on display, obviously you're gonna get that up to seven days of battery life. The two things that really destroy battery life is of course the always on display and GPS tracking. Now, of course, with GPS, you can switch to a hybrid model or just use the phone GPS tracker so that you can really save a lot of battery. So you don't, you're not forced to use the inbuilt GPS tracker that's on the actual watch. So you can save your battery if you have your phone on you all the time. And of course, you can disable the always on display to get that seven day battery life, which in turn is a lot better than many other smartwatches out there. Now, one big thing that has been upgraded from the previous generations of the Fitbit Charge series is the actual charger. It finally uses magnets, and I very much welcome this change because trust me, in the previous generations, you would have to kind of clip it on and kind of align the contact sensors for it to charge. And sometimes it would just be a very cumbersome process and sometimes you would miss. And then after an hour, you come back to your Fitbit and you notice that it's not fully charged. So that can be really annoying. It took about one hour to get from zero to 80%, which is actually quite fast. So overall, it's a shame that we don't get a full weeks of battery life when you have always on display, which I think is a very essential feature to have enabled, but that's a personal preference, of course. But the fact that it has 24 seven heart rate and SpO2 variation tracking during your sleep, I'm actually very impressed with the battery life for this type of watch. And I'm very much happy with kind of the results and I don't mind charging it every three days or if I ever disable always on display every seven days. So let's talk about comfort and fit. And now this is a, one of the major strengths of the Fitbit Charge 5, and it's just how small and lightweight it is. This means that you can easily wear this fitness tracker 24 seven, and this will really take full advantage of their health reports because you're obviously tracking 24 seven. Now, normally when I go skateboarding, like I'm doing some intense activity or, or going to the gym, I kind of remove my TicWatch Pro 3. I don't really wear it that often. And you know, because it's just too clunky, especially during like really intense sweaty sports. So this means I don't get a very holistic view of all my daily activities over a long period of time, which inherently makes my health reports from let's say a TicWatch Pro 3 or any type of bigger watch 
kind of inaccurate. I don't get a full assessment of my health. Now with this Fitbit, wearing this to let's say going to the gym, rock climbing, or even skateboarding, I never noticed it on my wrist. The best part about this is that it has auto activity detection, which works very accurately. So the way that works is that it senses your heart rate is elevated for a particular session. And then the charge five is pretty smart. It has these algorithms to actually accurately detect when you start and stop that exercise. This means that when you go to the gym, you don't have to like stop what you're doing, go to your touch screen and fiddle around and say, okay, let me start my exercise. You can just simply walk into the facility, start running or lifting weights or skateboarding, whatever you want to do in terms of exercise. And then it's going to accurately, you know, kind of attract how many calories you spent, the times that your heart rate zones were in. Let's say, for example, I want to be in a fat burning uh, heart rate zone, which is, you know, everybody wants to lose weight. So it's kind of nice to see these metrics without having to do any manual input. And this is the key thing about this watch. So by default in the Fitbit settings, it requires 50 minutes of doing a sustained workload, but you can adjust that in the settings obviously to increase it or lower that threshold. This is my favorite aspect about this Fitbit is that it integrates with your daily life. Because the device is so small on your wrists and that you don't need to mess around to start or end a workout session, it's just nice to have this 24 seven tracking that's guaranteed to happen which means that overall in the long term, you're going to get a more accurate health report. In fact, I think this is a new paradigm shift in smartwatches and fitness trackers that I hope manufacturers really start to adopt. I want, the, I want to make these devices more passive and require less human input to do its job. Any health device that requires fiddling with menus or requiring human intervention or human manual input just to start a workout, for example, is already asking way too much in our world of advanced AI algorithms. Unfortunately, there's one small caveat to the auto workout detection feature that I experienced while trying to weightlift in my gym. Either my workout was too short or my heart rate wasn't elevated enough for a long period of time for the Charge 5 to detect my weightlifting workout. So far, this was the only exercise where I had to manually start and end my workout, which is a little bit unfortunate. Now, yes, of course, we're not fully there yet, but in order to get a, for example, a accurate GPS tracking of your run, I, I don't expect the, the app to kind of know to turn on the GPS. Obviously you have to go into the menus, manually start your bike or run exercise so that you can track with the GPS enabled. By the way, my GPS accuracy was excellent. I had no issues, although it is very strenuous on the battery. I believe it's up to five hours of continuous GPS tracking, which shows how intense and resource draining the GPS tracking is on this tiny little watch. Now, some people reporting issues with GPS tracking not working properly, uh, especially with the inbuilt GPS. So let me know in the comment section if you had experienced any GPS issues with your Fitbit Charge 5. As I mentioned before, if you have your smartphone with you, the Fitbit is smart enough to kind of just piggyback off your phone's GPS instead of trying to use the GPS that is built in. But of course, if you don't have your phone, you can use the inbuilt GPS for you know accurate tracking of your run, for example. So let's talk about the build quality or just how it looks. So in addition to this watch being very light and very small on my wrist, I have to really admire the overall aesthetics that is offered, especially when it's paired with a very nice always on display watch face. Also, if you turn off the always on display, it can act like a very discreet fitness band. So it's gonna work in most daily life situations. The detachable silicone bands come in two sizes, small or large, and they're not compatible with the previous generations of the Fitbit Charge series, which were more prone to break, so perhaps this is an upgrade overall. I'm starting to see a new trend in fitness trackers in terms of their bands where there's these excess strap and you kind of wrap it inside the band. This is something that I've seen on the Galaxy Watch 4, and I kind of like this because it makes it less prone to break and get caught onto something when you have that excess strap hanging out. So these interchangeable bands can be customized to your liking, so you can have different colors, and I find them overall very comfortable, so I'm very happy with their performance. So the Fitbit Charge 5 is a radically different design from the previous generations. I had one minor issue with it, and it's the lack of a button. Now on the previous generations, you had this excellent capacitive sight button, which was really nice to navigate out of menus and screens and stuff like that. And I do miss it, but it honestly isn't a deal breaker given how passive this fitness tracker is. Now on the plus side, instead of having a button, you get this EDA sensor, which are these two shiny things on the side of the watch. And it kind of adds a very nice aesthetic, a shiny aesthetic, if, may, if I may add. And it kind of just makes the tracker look more premium, at least in my opinion. Now, whether or not the EDA sensor versus a button was a good trade-off, we'll find out. We'll explore that a little bit later in the sensor hardware section. So in this next section, I wanted to cover the UI, the operating system, the navigation, and just a bunch of other miscellaneous things. Firstly, I like how customizable the watch is, especially in terms of your health. For example, you can set a schedule when the sleep mode is enabled so you're not disturbed while you're sleeping. 
You can obviously set a range for when the always on display is enabled. And of course, you can toggle certain notifications so that you're not spammed. And I think that's the key thing to health is to not get notifications on your wrist all the time. You only want really important things and being able to kind of select the ones, the apps that you want to see is very important. Obviously, you can quickly, you know, swipe down into the menus and then just quickly enable do not disturb and other types of settings that will, you know, help you focus more. So being able to control all these notifications and when you want to be disturbed and not be disturbed is extremely important, especially because this vibrating motor is extremely powerful, even at the lowest settings. There are only two settings, normal and very strong. Now, this might be a good thing for those who are, you know, don't have very sensitive wrists and they want to get notified, but it can be a little bit jarring if you get three messages in a row from your friend who like, you know, message you three times in a row with like a story. I think Fitbit can be a little bit more clever with how it handles vibrations. For example, maybe your wrist should only vibrate maximum once every 30 seconds so that you don't get spammed by your friend who's sending you, you know, like a bunch of text messages under 30 seconds. Now this haptic feedback doesn't feel cheap at all. It feels like force touch, which is something akin to the Apple Watch. So it feels really good, but it can be a little bit annoying if you don't know how to control it. So in terms of the overall UI navigation, just swiping between places, I have to say it's, it's a really simple watch, so there's not much to it. I really like that you can quickly access your Fitbit Pay by just swiping down. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of UI lag and I think it could be improved. It just seems a little bit sluggish. It's not as snappy as I wish it would be. When you're swiping through menus and screens, it can feel a little bit unresponsive and it would require you to, to make a couple extra swipes just to get to the next part. So. Yeah, it's it's a little bit, it's not super perfect, but it's nowhere near as bad as like GoPro laggy interface. Like I said before, if you're buying this watch, don't expect to be spending too much time diving in between menus and looking at things like the weather, because one, this is the, these smart features are very limited in this watch, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And number two, it's just not a fun experience to have to like constantly do things on your watch on a, such a small screen. So none of these are actually deal breakers. I'm gonna talk about some of the major cons I have for this watch a little bit later in this video. So stay tuned for that. One really important feature that I need for any type of device that sits on my wrist is really good notification support, especially on Android. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes when you get a notification on Android, let's say a Gmail message, you actually see these kind of options. You have these kind of actions that you can do, for example, reply, or you can archive the message, or you can just delete it. I wanna be able to do that on my Fitbit Charge 5 for any notification I receive. And for most of the notifications on Android, it does work very well. Of course, iPhone users don't get the full support because it's a walled garden there. But for Android, everything seemed to work except for one app. It was Octal Verify. It's a two-factor app. I don't know if anyone uses it, but basically I wasn't able to perform any of the inline actions in order to, you know, do my two-factor authentication. The weird thing is that on my TickWatch Pro 3, when I get the notification from Okta Verify, it totally works. I'm able to reply yes or no to my two-factor authentication, but it doesn't work on the Fitbit Charge 5. So that's a little bit unfortunate. It seems like not everything is supported and it's a little bit concerning, but obviously inline actions for notifications do work, especially on Android. And being able to reply with some can messages to text messages or even reject phone calls is a very nice addition on my wrist. By the way, I created a couple of Android apps around bike sharing and transit, which was just featured for Fitbit's notifications. CycleNow is an Android only app that was designed to complement your city's official bike share app. The way it helps you is that you can quickly set a destination and the app will find the two best bike and parking stations. This is especially helpful in foreign cities with its full offline support. You can tap the shortcut to open your bike shares providers app to unlock a bike. Download CycleNow or TransitNow on the Google Play Store. Okay, let's get back to the original content. So one of the things I really like about Fitbit is not just the watch itself, it's the actual in-app experience. Now I'm gonna talk about all the insights, health metrics and reports that you're gonna get in the next section, but on a more surface level, I just really like how easy and simple the app is. And this is something that you can really underappreciate, especially if you haven't tried other fitness trackers and smartwatches out there. You can even log into your Fitbit account on your desktop Chrome browser and see all your information. In fact, this hidden feature reminds me of Garmin's wonderful Connect web browser app. I personally find this way of accessing my health metrics easier than on my smartphone, especially when I want to do some analysis. You can even trace along your running route to see stats at the position and time. This is quite impressive. So another cool feature you can do on Fitbit's desktop website is that you can export all your data. 
However, unfortunately, the data is quite limited. You don't get access to all the information that is there. And this is something that I'm, I think is an utter shame because I would love to be able to not be restricted to Fitbit's platform. It would be really cool if I could export all my data out to maybe some other third-party provider and then they can do their own type of report, kind of similar to like 23andMe and Ancestry where you can upload your DNA to another website and get more advanced detailed analysis of your data. This is something that I really hope becomes more seamless and integrated with APIs and third-party app developers so that, for example, maybe I can you know, migrate all my data to Apple Watch or Google Fit or, like I said, a third-party provider that can do more analysis on my data. After all, at the end of the day, this is your data. You're generating this. So I think it's very fair and ethical for you to have unadulterated access to all the data that is collected and not just the basic limited information that is available right now. So let's talk about the EDA scanner hardware sensor. Now, unfortunately, like I said before, they eliminated the buttons to add this two sensors on the side of, of, the, of this fitness tracker. Right off the bat, I have to say it's kind of pointless. I don't really see the benefit in it, especially that it takes three minutes to do. You have to like it feels like an eternity to have to hold your hand over here and just hold it for three minutes, start breathing. It, it's probably more geared towards mindfulness and trying to help you relax and meditate, which I can appreciate. But I just feel like the whole feature is not very, it's not very passive, right? It's, it requires you to stop and do something throughout your day and kind of just hold it for three minutes. It just, it's asking too much from the user to do just to get this data point. So I don't, even when I do get the data points, you get these like, responses like 20 responses and you're like for example i'm going in an upward trend so maybe you're getting more stressed so i don't know this eda scan for me personally wasn't a very cool feature funny enough this eda scan feature kind of reminds me of the galaxy watch 4 body composition sensor which kind of measures in a very similar type of way where you have to kind of wait and hold your hand on the actual device i would have much preferred to have a body composition meter because i think being able to tell how much fat percentage you have in your body is a lot more important so let's talk about sleep tracking. Now Fitbit has a very good reputation when it comes to the accuracy of detecting your sleep. Now this has been actually proven by a fellow YouTuber by the name of the Quantified Scientist. And he goes into a lot of detailed analysis of all these fitness trackers and smartwatches and put them to the test against medical grade equipment, stuff that I, I don't personally have. Now I've tried my best to do my own independent research to verify that Fitbit is in fact a very accurate sleep tracker. And in my reports and based on my research, I did find that it is a very, very accurate sleep tr tracker, especially in terms of tracking your various stages. We're talking about REM, light, deep sleep, and when you're awake. And of course, the start and stop times. I have to say, hands down, Fitbit is the best fitness tracker out there on the market. And I've tried so many different watches. I'm just thoroughly impressed of how well their algorithms are tuned, their hardware sensors have really kind of just made the whole experience of seeing your sleep score and seeing all the various sleep stages just to be a very good experience from the UI perspective, but also just very accurate. So you can actually make some actionable things. You can actually do things to improve your sleep in the long term. So you might be wondering, how exactly did I measure my sleep? What did I do? What, what tools did I use to validate this kind of idea that the Fitbit is the most accurate sleep tracker? Well, I actually used a camera to monitor my sleep and I compared it with other devices that are more medical grade, like the Better Sleep Tuner. And what I found out was that it was working out very well in terms of aligning specific types of events throughout the night. Now I have a sleep condition called sleep apnea and also this other condition called catatherenia, which is a condition where I kind of just groan while I'm sleeping, a high pitched groan as I exhale. <coughs> And sleep apnea, of course, is where you stop breathing throughout the night, which we can cause your blood's oxygen saturation to go down. Now, I have my CPAP data, which is the machine that I use to pump continuous air pressure into my mouth. That records data. I have the better sleep tuner. I have the sleep tracker. And I have these events. And the good thing about the Wise Cam is that it captures events based on noise and movement. And movement is obviously an indicator of whether you're having light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep. So what I was able to do is quantify all this data, kind of synthesize it into one report, and correlate certain events. So for example, if I detect a sleep apnea event or a catatherina event where I'm moaning, I can correlate that to REM sleep. And what ended up happening was that every time I had REM sleep, I had more apnea events, which according to my diagnosis is what generally happens. REM sleep is more of a stage where I do get a lot more 
um, sleep apnea events and Katharina events, whatever you want to call it. So overall, after comparing this for like many days, I found that it was consistently finding the right times where I was in REM sleep. And when I'm deep sleep, I don't get it. When I'm in light, light sleep, I don't get these types of events. So by analyzing all the video and audio and all the other sensors and combining it into one view, I was able to validate that yes, at least to some degree, the Fitbit tracker is doing a really good job at tracking my you know, various sleep stages. Now there's one place where I think the Fitbit tracker is a little bit lacking, and that is in the SpO2 or the blood oxygen saturation variation graph. Now the, the thing that I don't like about that graph is that it's just a fixed graph. Unlike all the other graphs that are pro provided by Fitbit, like your various sleep stages, they do a good job of being able to show what exactly, what are the time periods at which you were in REM sleep. So you can click on this section of the graph over here, as you can see, and you can see that, oh, from this time to this time, you're in REM sleep. But if you go onto the blood oxygen variation graph, it's just a fixed graph. You, you can't seek through it. You can't see along the timeline axis where exactly you had this high variation event, which is, I think it's really unfortunate. Speaking of the SpO2 variation, I think it's also a little bit unfortunate that you don't get the raw percentage of your SpO2 graph throughout the night. I know that SpO2 is a very hard metric to track, especially when you're moving around in sleep. It may not be very accurate and therefore not very usable to the user, especially when you know we have all these Garmin watches and we see our blood SpO2 kind of very so wildly. And it's kind of like, I can't make any sense of this data. So I think what Fitbit is trying to do is very admirable. They're trying to kind of provide a variation instead of the actual absolute number of your percentage as for your SpO2, which in turn makes it easier to digest and kind of easier to see. But I would also at least want to be able to seek along the timeline axis so that I can compare, oh, for example, I got a high variation over here. I want to be able to compare it with all my other devices to verify that this is happening for, you know, for the right reasons. So I have one quick note about the SpO2 variation graph, which I found the results to be quite interesting. Even though I rarely had a high variation, I did notice that I tended to have a higher overall variation when compared to someone who was not diagnosed with sleep apnea. The chart on the left is a sample of my SpO2 variation, which is quite zigzaggedy, as you can see. And on the right, the patient is someone without any sleep breathing disturbances, so they have no sleep apnea. And you can see that it's a rather straight line. I compared over 10 nights of this type of data and all the results were consistent, which is a sign that the SpO2 variation sensor is quite good. So another sleep related feature that is really cool is the smart alarm feature, which basically allows you to be awakened 30 minutes prior to your set time if you are in a light phase instead of let's say a REM phase or a deep sleep phase. This helps avoid daytime grogginess when you wake up. And apparently my friend who uses it quite a lot swears by it. He thinks it kind of wakes him up and you just feel less groggy. But personally for myself, I'm always gonna wake up as late as possible for whatever appointment I need. So I personally would not want any alarm to wake me up earlier than I need to be. So this feature doesn't work for me, but apparently my friend uses it all the time and it works very well. So overall, the sleep feature is extremely accurate. I validate it against all my other data points. I have to agree with the quantified scientists that Fitbit is probably the one platform you probably wanna pick if you really care about your sleep. So speaking of deal breakers or cons about this watch, I know I've been very positive, but I do have some major things that really kind of just personally annoy me a lot about this watch. The first one is that there are no basic smart features with this watch or very, very limited. For example, it is, seems to be missing a lot of basic apps like a calendar or an agenda app so I can see the next calendar event. So I don't, I can't sync my Google calendar basically. And this is something that is on all types of fitness trackers and smart watch, smart watches out there. Now, you, yes, you do get calendar events that come native in, natively integrated into this watch, but you can't just you know view the next schedule, the next appointment that you have, which is you know, something that I is related to time and we wanna be on time for our meetings. I think this is very important. The next big thing, and this was a quite a shock for me, was that there is no weather app. And this existed on the previous generations of the Fitbit Charge line. I'm just very shocked that they don't have a basic weather app. I know it's not the most fun experience to look at it, but being able to see the current weather before you go outside and just quickly glance at your watch is very convenient and I do miss it a lot. Even my super slim Vivo Smart 4 has a weather app. I just hope in the future Fitbit will update the Charge 5 with some basic smart features. So speaking about Garmin's Vivo Smart 4, which is a direct competitor to the Charge 5, when is Garmin ever going to release an update to this? 
I'm kind of worried about the rumors indicating that Garmin wants to exit the ultra slim fitness tracker market. I hope this is not the case. Already, the lack of a basic calendar app and a weather app really hurts the glanceability of this watch. Speaking of glanceability, I think that's another thing that's a little bit lacking is in their, in when you talk about their watch faces, there isn't a lot of information that you can customize. Yes, you can tap on the metric, the one metric that is on the actual watch face. You can toggle between, for example, your steps, the distance you traveled, your heart rate and stuff like that. That's all nice and fine and dandy, but it would be nice to see, let's say your next calendar event or customize it that so that you can see both your weather and your next calendar event, for example. So another very basic smart feature that you would expect to see on this type of kind of device is that there's no find my phone type of feature. And I think this is a really easy feature to implement for the developers at Fitbit. I don't know what they're paying them. You know, they're bought by Google. They're just all happy now. But the thing with not being able to locate your phone is something that I really miss and something that I think is very low hanging fruit for them to implement, but they just don't seem to have it for some reason. So speaking about more serious issues I've had with this watch, I think that, that the weightlifting exercise is really leaves a lot to be desired, to be honest. It's just super basic. It doesn't have any rep detection, kind of like what you see on the Garmin or the old Wear OS. I mean, come on, even Garmin's Vivo Smart 4, which is a tiny little watch, had rep counting. Even though it wasn't that best, it was still a lot better than this kind of really basic implementation of weightlifting. So overall, the lack of basic smart features like a calendar event or no weather apps, or the lack of glanceability for your watch face, not being able to set different complications, I think is a real, it really hurts the smart feature department for this type of watch. Now I under, I know, I understand that you're not buying this probably for smart features. If you really wanted that, you would probably get the Fitbit Sense or like a, like a bigger type of smart fitness tracker or smart watch. But I think it's really unfortunate that they just don't implement these features. I think it's should be really easy to implement and shouldn't really affect the overall usability of this type of watch. In fact, I find it a little bit odd that this Fitbit Charge 5 has advanced features like Fitbit Pay or an EDA scanner, but not these basic features I mentioned earlier. So speaking about the Fitbit Premium experience, let's talk about that. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I think Fitbit is finally trying to make some sense of your data and provide some really interesting insights as opposed to just listing a bunch of stats about your health. Something I critiqued Garmin and other fitness tracker manufacturers in the past was that they would just list an overwhelming amount of data points, so much that it was just hard to make sense of anything and there was no actual insights. So one thing I really like about the Fitbit platform is that they provide actionable insights or just easier to digest information about your health. The key aspect about this is trying to make it so simple that anyone can understand the information while still not restricting the data for people who are really want advanced metrics. For example, I like how Fitbit made it so easy to view different sleep stages by grouping the various sleep stages into you know, sections. But I was a little bit disappointed that the SpO2 variation graph is just so limited. You obviously can't seek along the timeline, so you don't know where exactly you had a high variation in order to compare it with other data points like the ones from your CPAP machine. Or in my case, my Wise Cam that was filming me at night recording all the various sleep events based on video and audio feedback. Overall, I'm very happy that Fitbit is moving in the right direction of providing more meaningful and personalized data reports that are still detailed but easy to understand and digest. But the main question still remains, is it still worth paying a yearly subscription fee for the Fitbit Premium service? Well, in my opinion, I do not think it is worth it at all, at least for now until the daily readiness score is available. And this is really good news because if I'm buying this piece of hardware, I don't wanna have to be forced into buying, spending more money on a monthly subscription just to see some hidden metrics that are perhaps really important. Now, of course, this is a matter of personal preference and luckily you do get a six month trial with the Fitbit Charge 5, but in all honesty, the premium experience didn't offer anything super compelling. For example, with the premium sleep tracking features, you unlock sleep restlessness and sleep heart rate, which is a graph over your entire sleep time. While I think it's a little bit silly to charge customers such a large fee to see this data, I don't think you really need it. You also get some PDF reports to look back at your overall health trends over a long period of time. You also get curated content to help with mindfulness and, and workouts and stuff like that. But in the end, I just don't think premium is worth it. And I'm glad that Fitbit hasn't forced all its users to into a costly subscription just to access their basic health metrics. Perhaps in the future, it'll be more useful. Let's answer some questions. If you're upgrading from the Fitbit Charge 3 or 4 and you want to know whether or not this is a worthy upgrade, 
Well, it really depends. Do you really care about the always on display? Then perhaps, yes, it might be a worthy upgrade. But all the other types of advancements and stuff like that, I don't think you're gonna get much of a big upgrade. So I would probably wait for the next generation, especially if you have the Fitbit Charge 4. If you have the Fitbit Charge 3 and you don't have, and you really need GPS, maybe it's the time to upgrade. You might really appreciate all the new kind of features and hardware that you will get from it. Before I end this review, I wanna put a caveat that this review is not fully complete. At the time of filming this, two very interesting features that the Charge 5 will support was not available. This is very typical of Fitbit when they release new products like we've seen with the SpO2 sensor which was introduced firstly on the Charge 3. Anyway, I will update my channel with any significant updates to the Charge 5 including support for their ECG sensor and daily readiness score. I'm particularly interested in the daily readiness score as it's similar to Garmin's body battery feature and may actually help me and you train more efficiently. I will also update this review if Fitbit ever releases updates to its smart capabilities for this watch, like adding back the weather and agenda apps. So stay subscribed for more future wearable content. So to conclude this, I have to say that Fitbit Charge 5 is a very elegant, simple design that makes it really easy to track your health 24 seven, especially that it's such a small footprint on your wrist. I really like that. Some of the things that are deal breakers for me personally may not be a deal breaker for you. And they include the, the lack of basic utility apps like you would get from an agenda, calendar, weather app, find my phone. And I'm not even asking it to be like an, you know, having Alexa or a voice assistant or something like that. But it's just kind of weird that if you look at the wise band, which is a fitness tracker, it actually had Alexa and it had a 30 day battery life. So I think that the Fitbit charge five can be so much more, especially in the smart feature department. And I really think it's a little bit lacking in that. But other than that, I really like how easy it is. It's just such a passive thing. You just wear it. You don't really have to think about having to start and stop your exercises. And you get these advanced health and sleep metrics that is really gonna help you improve your health overall. They have social interactions where you can compete with your friends for making sure that you kind of put yourself in a social situation where there's pressure to you know exercise more. And I really like that these health metrics and insights into your sleep really help you kind of just adjust and tweak your life for the better. I really think that it's a device that is honestly trying to make us more healthier in the long term. And I think that it's going to be a very good investment for your health, especially if you have an insurance plan that covers it. Anyways, that's it for this video. If you have any questions about the Fitbit Charge 5, please let me know in the comment section down below. I'd be very happy to answer. See you in the comment section.